Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. Today, I will interpret for you The Catcher in the Rye, the representative work of American author J.D. Salinger. This highly acclaimed book was published in 1951 when Salinger was only 32 years old. It achieved unprecedented success upon its release, with sales steadily increasing. Salinger became a national author overnight. The book has been reprinted multiple times and became the favorite book of young people in the United States, selling 250,000 copies annually. To this day, it has sold over 65 million copies, solidifying its position as a bestseller and long-lasting book. The Catcher in the Rye can be seen as a small flame that, once ignited, became an incendiary force, igniting and even detonating certain thoughts and trends, such as the Beat Generation and the Confessional Movement, all of which were influenced by it. Even the protagonist created by Salinger, the foul-mouthed teenager Holden Caulfield, with his words, actions, and attire, became an object of imitation for young readers. Let's first delve into some interesting behind-the-scenes stories to understand the information concealed behind these shining figures and terms. Before the publication of The Catcher in the Rye, the young Salinger had already published a series of excellent works in The New Yorker. The magazine is described online as follows. The New Yorker is a serious-minded magazine, established in 1925, with a weekly publication featuring news, fiction, and commentary. It excels in dissecting the cultural pulse and serves as a pioneer in intellectual trends in politics, literature, and art. Its outstanding feature is its long-standing literary character and intellectual temperament. Clearly, the New Yorker represents a pioneer of intellectual trends and cultural elites, possessing a certain degree of elitism. For most writers, having their work published in such a magazine is a form of affirmation. In 1947, at the age of 28, Salinger published a series of highly acclaimed works in the New Yorker, including A Perfect Day for Banana Fish. It was this short story that led the proud publication to enter into a secret contract with him called the First Serial Rights Agreement. One interesting provision in the contract was that the New Yorker would pay Salinger a certain amount each year to obtain priority review rights for his works. There were rumors that the amount was $30,000, while the average annual income in the United States at the time was $3,000, and a family car cost just over $1,000. Following this agreement, Salinger submitted nine short stories to the New Yorker, out of which seven were accepted, and two were rejected. Two years after the publication of The Catcher in the Rye, these nine stories were compiled into Salinger's most famous collection of short stories, Nine Stories. Once published, Nine Stories spent three months on the New York Times bestseller list. Another peculiar occurrence was that The Catcher in the Rye was written during the period covered by the first serial rights agreement. As customary, Salinger initially submitted the manuscript to The New Yorker, but it was rejected. Salinger then sold the rights to the book to a publishing company called Little, Brown and Company. And so, The Catcher in the Rye missed its chance with The New Yorker, but the adventurous Little, Brown and Company fortuitously published the book. The fact that this unconventional novel was rejected by the New Yorker seems to indicate the mainstream cultural direction of the American middle-class intelligentsia at the time. Next, we'll untangle the setting of the field and the relationship between Salinger and the protagonist, Holden Caulfield, within the context of the era. Let's start by discussing Salinger's background. Salinger was born on January 1, 1919, in New York. His father was the son of a Jewish rabbi and ran a cheese and ham business, making their family well off. They belonged to a typical middle-class family. Salinger had little interest in studying from a young age and even dropped out of school during his middle school years. At the age of 15, his father sent him to a military school in Pennsylvania, which served as the prototype for Pensy Prep in the novel and also marks the beginning of the story. Part 1 the overall story structure is very simple. In a nutshell, it's about a foul-mouthed 16-year-old boy named Holden who gets expelled from school right before Christmas and then spends a couple of days wandering around New York City. The time frame of this period is only one day and two nights, and Salinger narrates the entire process in the first person. As for Holden's family background, 
His father is a lawyer in New York, and his mother is a housewife. He has three siblings, and Holden is the second oldest. So, his family is a typical middle-class household. However, this family has suffered a great blow with the death of Holden's younger brother, Allie. Allie was a red-haired boy who loved playing baseball, and although he appears infrequently in the novel, his death had a profound impact on Holden's mother, who developed a serious mental illness as a result. It also became a hidden source of sorrow for Holden. In Holden's definition of the catcher's role, one of the responsibilities is to catch the children when they reach the cliff's edge, which is also related to Allie's untimely death. His older brother, D.B., is a talented writer who works in Hollywood writing screenplays. Holden particularly disdains his brother's involvement in Hollywood, which reflects his own values. His ten-year-old sister, Phoebe, is an academically excellent and adorable girl. Holden talks about her in great detail, believing that she is the only person who truly understands him. As the story begins, Holden complains about Pensy Prep, the school he attends. It is a private preparatory boarding school located in Pennsylvania, United States. Prior to Pensy Prep, Holden had attended several other full-time boarding schools, all of which were exclusively for boys. These schools can be seen as customized versions of middle-class guardianships. Famous figures such as John F., Kennedy and Franklin D. Roosevelt also attended such schools, making them an educational staple for affluent families. In order to attract students, the school advertises in various magazines, often featuring images of handsome young men riding horses and playing polo. This suggestive imagery is one of the phony aspects in Holden's eyes, as there are no horses anywhere near the school. Horses and polo have also become symbols of the upper-middle-class elite, displaying a certain outward status. Despite the glamorous appearance, the inner workings of these prestigious schools are not necessarily any more sophisticated. At Pensy, students frequently lose their belongings. The more expensive the school, the more thieves it has, Holden remarks. Because his coat was stolen, he sits on a little hill freezing his ass off while watching football. Here, we can experience the unique narrative style of the book, which is filled with colloquial teenage language and lacks embellished vocabulary. Yet, it expresses the authentic feelings of the adolescent in a free and candid manner. This is the most remarkable aspect of the entire novel and a narrative style known as teenage slang. Holden watches the football game with great engagement. He sits beside a cannon and casually mentions that he doesn't know whether it was left from the Revolutionary War or some other time. The war mentioned here refers to the once proud American Revolutionary War. Throughout the subsequent story, war-related terms occasionally emerge, such as the Normandy invasion and the atomic bomb. However, these references are fleeting, and Salinger seems reluctant to dwell on them. In fact, these sporadic references are bullets shot at Salinger, representing the hidden pain that he cannot forget but cannot touch. They are also the origin of the catcher's role. Next, we will introduce the hidden Salinger within Holden and the portrayal of Holden through Salinger's writing in an alternating fashion. In 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, and the United States declared war. Salinger was 22 years old at the time. The following year, he enlisted and continued to write. Two years later, in January 1944, Salinger applied for a position in the Counterintelligence Corps and joined the 12th Regiment, heading to the Western Front in Europe. That same year, the Normandy invasion took place and the German forces retreated from Paris. Salinger and his 12th Regiment were among the first American troops to enter Paris. The people of Paris were extremely enthusiastic, constantly stopping jeeps to offer wine to the men and embracing them, reminiscent of the famous photograph The Kiss of Victory. But what made Salinger most happy was meeting Ernest Hemingway in Paris. At the time, Hemingway was a war correspondent for the magazine Colliers, and the two agreed to meet at a hotel, where they drank and discussed literature. Hemingway's nickname was Papa, and Salinger continued to refer to him as such. This brief moment may have been the most beautiful day in Salinger's mind during his time in Paris. This fleeting beauty could not erase the indelible mark that war left on Salinger. At that time, Salinger wrote a short story called The Magic Ear Muffs 
based on his first-hand experience after the Normandy invasion, where he witnessed the scattered corpses and devastation everywhere. All of this filled him with anger, and in the novel, he condemns the military and war, warning the older generation not to romanticize war to children, but to understand its blindness and folly. In this story, Salinger begins to question, where is God? That is the disdainful young man in the rye field, the one who appears in Pensy with mockery and against tradition, Holden. Part 2. Let's continue talking about Salinger. After spending about a month in Paris, Salinger was sent to the Hurtgen Forest on the German-French border, a heavily fortified area held by the German forces. The battle lasted for three months, and due to strategic mistakes, the entire Allied forces suffered devastating losses, with the slaughter being extremely brutal. By the time of the retreat, Salinger's regiment, which initially consisted of 3,080 soldiers, was reduced to only 563. As a survivor who narrowly escaped death, Salinger had essentially ventured through the gates of hell. Five months later, in May 1945, World War II came to an end. During this period, Salinger continued to participate in intelligence gathering and witnessed the horrific concentration camps where the smell of burning flesh permeated the air, an odor that could never be erased from his nostrils. Afterward, Salinger wrote the seventh story featuring Holden as the protagonist, titled A Sandwich with No Jelly, in which the pain caused by death is omnipresent. Salinger suffered from post-war psychological syndrome and was transferred to a hospital in Nuremberg for treatment. The war undoubtedly destroyed certain aspects of him. These experiences belong to Salinger and also to Holden. It is through understanding the hardships and brutality of war that we can see the inner turmoil and helplessness within Holden. These elements establish the underlying tone of this novel, even though it adopts the narrative style of youthful colloquialism and is filled with profanity. It is not intended to be humorous or light-hearted. In post-World War II America, the economy continued to grow. From 1945 to 1960, the nation's GDP doubled, giving rise to a new middle class. However, alongside this prosperity, the wounds of the post-war era persisted. They did not fade away with the apparent calmness on the surface. Instead, the high casualties among veterans prompted people to enter a period of reflection. Holden's mockery of the adult world and his disdain for various phony aspects are, in fact, Salinger's questions and introspection, waking up but having nowhere to go, feeling helpless and uncertain, with a bleak future ahead. Unlike the beat generation that followed, the writers and poets of the beatnik movement took direct action. They hit the road, let themselves lose without asking why, aimlessly searching and resisting. They embraced drugs and promiscuity displaying more intense behavior. They replaced depression with manic energy. On the other hand, the catcher and the rye boys couldn't find any solutions. Their supposed right path was to become middle-class parents like their own, but they completely rejected those values and lifestyles on a spiritual level. Just like Holden's contempt for Pensy and his disdain for his brother D.B.'s Hollywood dream. Let's continue following Holden's whereabouts. He stayed at school for an afternoon, and went to visit his history teacher as a farewell after being expelled. As an underachieving teenager, he couldn't escape the teacher's preachy lectures, which made Holden extremely uncomfortable. He endured until evening when he sat in the dormitory chatting and bickering with his roommate, still feeling utterly bored. This troublemaker seems to care about and value nothing, until his roommate mentioned that he hooked up with a girl named Jane in a casual tone. Holden got into a fight with him because of his flippant attitude and ended up getting beaten up with blood all over his face. Afterward, he took two minutes to pack his bags and left the school. There is no doubt that Jane is a cherished girl to Holden. They used to be neighbors, and Jane lived with her mother and stepfather, who was an alcoholic. Holden doesn't reveal all the information about Jane at the beginning. Jane keeps appearing in his memories in his hallucinations after failing to hire a prostitute and getting beaten up, and in comparison to vulgar girls. Jane's presence is constant throughout the novel, until it nears its end. The way Holden treasures and cherishes Jane inevitably brings to mind the movie Forrest Gump and the innocent Jenny in it. In fact, 
Forrest and Holden belong to the same era, and Jenny represents the beatnik movement, walking on the road. So, this novel is not just a story of a rebellious expelled teenager wandering the streets. By examining the pervasive details, we can see the enormous amount of hidden meaning behind it. This is a great historical trend, starting with The Catcher in the Rye, where various waves of rebellion and questioning emerged. Regardless of the era, literature and art always have the unique ability to speak up first with their keenness. Corresponding to this period, the confessional movement emerged in poetry, and the theater saw the rise of the theater of the absurd. These are all fruits of this intellectual wave. Artists and writers began to focus on the individual, their works pointed directly to personal inner experiences, family relationships inseparable from the individual, and society, as well as the societal malaise. Holden constantly assumes a stance of opposition and nonconformity. Speaking of this, we can observe an interesting phenomenon, which is Holden's unconventional and popular dressing style. He likes to wear his red hunting hat turned backwards, which has almost become Holden's personal logo. With the publication and success of the book, this gesture was quickly imitated by young readers. Even today, we can still see American youths dressing like this in TV shows or Hollywood movies. From this perspective, Salinger inadvertently crossed into the fashion world and became a trendsetter. Through Holden's cherished love for Jane, let's take a look at Salinger's own emotional journey. At the age of 19, Salinger started his first love affair with the daughter of his father's business partner, a ham importer and one of Poland's wealthiest men. Salinger served as their translator and spent 10 months with them. After World War II, Salinger applied for a transfer to Vienna but learned that the entire family had died in concentration camps, including his pure and crystal-like first love. Salinger wrote a short story for her called for Esme, with love and squalor. Another unresolved love affair took place when Salinger was 22 years old. At that time, Salinger had already started writing novels, but he received as many rejection letters as he did with his creations. To make a living, he had to work as a cruise ship entertainer. In July, he met Una, the 16-year-old daughter of playwright Eugene O'Neill, on the cruise ship. Salinger fell in love, but two years later, Una married the much older comedy maestro Charlie Chaplin. This relationship was a significant blow to Salinger. His beloved woman was snatched away by Chaplin, which was extremely frustrating. Afterward, Salinger's emotions remained relatively closed off until he got married for the first time and then divorced. This is briefly mentioned in The Catcher in the Rye, so let's continue reading. After failing to hire a prostitute and getting beaten up in return, the powerless 16-year-old boy, in front of the pimp, cried with a sense of grievance. He sat in the bathroom for an hour, fantasizing about being shot, imagining himself seeking revenge with a gun, and imagining Jane bandaging him. In this way, he fell asleep in a muddled state of mind. When Holden woke up, he left the hotel and encountered two nuns on the street. The simplicity of the nuns touched him, so he donated ten dollars and chatted with them for a while. Afterward, he headed towards Broadway, intending to buy a record for his sister Phoebe. He had made up his mind to visit his sister. It was at this moment that a child coming out of a church caught his attention. The child wasn't walking on the sidewalk but walking right next to the curb, softly humming as he walked. As Holden approached, he heard the child singing, If a body catch a body coming through the rye. In contrast to this, cars zoomed by on the busy street and the crowd flowed incessantly. It was a noisy world. But the child was oblivious to all this. He continued to walk attentively next to the curb, repeatedly humming that line of the song. Do you see it? Why become a catcher in the rye? Salinger provides the answer in this place. The nuns and the noise, the child in this clamoring world, Holden sees the warmth in this intense contrast. After meeting his sister Phoebe, Holden had a conversation with her. He said, I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all. Thousands of little kids, and nobody's around. Nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean if they're running and they don't look where they're going, 
I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I'd do all day. I'd just be the catcher in the rye and all. This is Holden's guardianship, his protection for his deceased younger brother Allie, his sister Phoebe, and even his classmate who committed suicide by jumping off a building. It's a guardianship of all things innocent, keeping them away from hypocrisy, ugliness, war lies, and the chaotic reality of the world. It's also Salinger's escape. Although The Catcher in the Rye was a bestseller, it is not a popular novel, and Salinger did not provide Holden with a bright ending. It's merely an absence of running away but without any sudden enlightenment. There is no transformation into a well-behaved person of the world, nor does he escape into seclusion like Jia Baoyu. Instead, the book presents a realistic portrayal of the protagonist's life. There are legends that Salinger became obsessed with mysticism, Eastern Buddhism, and Zen after the publication of The Catcher in the Rye, and this may well be true, but it did not occur after the writing of this book. Let's take a look at the scene where Holden meets Luce. Before meeting his sister Phoebe, Holden decides to go to a bar to find Luce. Luce was a student advisor when Holden attended another school and his father was a psychoanalyst who sometimes discussed topics such as sex, homosexuality, and sexual perversions with Holden. For Holden, he was an interesting friend. In the bar, Luce tells Holden that he has a girlfriend who is a sculptor from Shanghai, China. In their relationship, he found that Eastern philosophy was more satisfying than Western philosophy, as it pursued the unity of body and mind. After listening to Luce, Holden remained silent for a while, lost in thought. Salinger does not explicitly state what he is contemplating, but afterward, Holden begins to pester Luce, hoping to continue discussing this topic. At this point, whether it was Holden's desire for discussion or Salinger's pursuit is already beginning to emerge. In fact, Zen Buddhism was quite popular among the Beat generation. For example, Jack Kerouac and Gary Snyder were deeply influenced by the Tang Dynasty's Zen poet Han Chan. They attempted to break free from all constraints and pursue absolute freedom. The epigraph on the title page of Kerouac's The Dharma Bums is dedicated to Han Chan. On the other hand, Salinger, starting with the third edition of The Catcher in the Rye, forcefully demanded that the publisher remove his photograph. Whether it's his preference for a low profile or a reclusive lifestyle, he did purchase a piece of land with a small mountain spanning over 90 acres in the countryside of New Hampshire, where he began his nearly 60-year seclusion. After meeting his sister Phoebe, Holden plans to leave New York and find any job out west, then use the money he earns to build a little cabin and spend the rest of his life there. He says he wants to build the cabin near the edge of the woods, but not right in the middle of them, because I'd miss the goddamn sun. Let's take a look at Salinger. For years after the publication of The Catcher in the Rye, in 1955, at the age of 36, Salinger married a girl named Claire, who was 16 years younger than him. Shortly after their marriage, Salinger wanted to live alone in seclusion. He built a small cabin in the woods a quarter of a mile away from his home. The cabin was hidden behind a row of tall walls and a screen of trees, surrounded by trees with tall wire fences topped with alarms. The only connection between Salinger and the outside world was a rugged path that climbed the hill for several miles. At the end of the road, there stood a mailbox without a name, and along the way, you would see several signs hanging on trees saying no trespassing. To guard against potential intruders, he painted the cabin in a dark green color similar to the surrounding forest and spent most of his day there. Salinger seemed to be putting Holden's dream into practice. Holden planned to go live in the West, be a deaf-mute person, and meet another beautiful deaf-mute girl to live with him in the cabin. When they wanted to communicate, they would write their words on paper. According to unverified information, Salinger became increasingly eccentric and bizarre. For example, he reportedly drank his own urine for health reasons and sat for hours in a wooden box that was said to absorb life energy. When his children fell ill, he would use homeopathy to help them heal or treat them with acupuncture. However, the terrifying part was that he used wooden spikes instead of needles. This marriage lasted for eleven years and ended when Claire filed for divorce. Afterward, Salinger had some brief romantic relationships. 
In the late 1980s, he married O'Neill, who was much younger than him. O'Neill respected Salinger's reclusive lifestyle, so very little is known about this marriage. It seems to align with what Holden said, to avoid excessive disturbance, even in conversations between partners. Part 3. Returning to the book The Catcher in the Rye, it is actually not thick and can be read quickly. Apart from its storytelling, we can also find many cultural elements of that time in the book. In addition to the previously mentioned Hemingway, confessional poets, the Beat Generation, and Zen Buddhism, there is also the influence of jazz and pop culture. We can even trace the influence of the hippie movement and bohemian culture. Every detail mentioned in this book is enough to make it a footnote in the study of American culture. Since the day of its publication, the book has swept the literary world. However, at that time, it had two completely different perspectives. On one hand, many schools and libraries banned it and regarded it as a dangerous threat. On the other hand, young readers saw it as a must-read classic. Let's take a look at some interesting controversies caused by this book. In 1960, a teacher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was fired for teaching the novel in class but was later reinstated. From 1961 to 1982, The Catcher in the Rye was banned in American high schools and libraries. In 1981, the novel faced the strictest scrutiny and was also the second most frequently assigned book in high schools. However, there are even more significant incidents related to this novel, including two shootings. One of them was the infamous assassination of John Lennon. The description of the case goes like this. On a night in December 1980, Mark Chapman pulled out a gun and shot Lennon five times. He then calmly sat on the sidewalk and started reading The Catcher in the Rye. When asked by the police what he was doing, he said, This book is about me. Years later, Chapman revealed that he killed Lennon to become the protagonist Holden Caulfield. He even said in prison, I hope that one day all of you can read The Catcher in the Rye. All my efforts from now on are for this goal because this extraordinary book holds many answers. Additionally, there was another incident, the assassination attempt on President Reagan, four months later. At the crime scene, the police found a tattered copy of the catcher in the rye in the pocket of the assailant. John Hinckley Jr. seemingly unaffected by everything happening outside, Salinger had no interest in knowing about it. In the following 50-plus years of his life, he hired a team of aggressive lawyers to unreasonably prevent his former friends from writing anything that revealed his privacy. He also ruthlessly sued any publishers he believed violated his copyright. However, he continued to write, albeit without publishing. He found a wonderful tranquility and contentment in not releasing any more books. For him, publishing was a serious violation of his privacy. In 1992, a significant fire broke out in his house, yet he managed to evade the gaze of reporters. No one photographed him, and no one interviewed him. Subsequent news about him consisted only of memoirs from his daughter and lover, or disputes between his agents and publishers. Salinger stubbornly remained silent, to the extent that you couldn't even hear him breathe. Holden had envisioned all of this long ago, to dress up as a deaf mute so he wouldn't have to engage in stupid and pointless conversations with anyone. Finally, let's recap the key points of knowledge in this book. Firstly, the Catcher in the Rye is Salinger's only full-length novel and is widely recognized as a classic of modern literature. Its story structure is actually quite simple, revolving around a teenage boy who wanders the streets alone for a day and two nights after being expelled from school. Secondly, the historical background of The Catcher in the Rye is the post-World War II era when the American economy was experiencing rapid growth, resulting in the emergence of a new middle class. The accumulation of wealth coexisted with the aftermath of the war, leading people to contemplate the meaning of war and enter a period of painful reflection. The adolescents in the rye field represent the characters of that time. Thirdly, in terms of character portrayal, author Salinger and protagonist Holden are closely intertwined. In fact, a few years after the publication of the book, Salinger's chosen lifestyle mirrored the one described by Holden. Therefore, the book carries a certain autobiographical nature, and understanding either one allows us to enter their inner worlds. Fourthly, the most notable feature of this book is its narrative style. 
Salinger used a colloquial language known as used speak to vividly depict the entire story, and this narrative style is irreplicable. Every detail mentioned in the book serves as an annotation for studying American culture, making its thematic depth and richness profoundly honest. Fifthly, after the publication of The Catcher in the Rye, it had a tremendous impact on mainstream American culture. The controversies and imitations surrounding this book eventually sparked a cultural and intellectual movement of an era. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.